Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father God, we just want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for this wonderful morning. Indeed, mighty God, we pray that you bless our souls, almighty God. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for each and every person gathered here today, mighty God. We pray, almighty God, that Heavenly Father, you may touch them, almighty God. Heavenly Father, even as I bring your word, almighty God, I pray that I may decrease as you increase, almighty God. I pray, Heavenly Father, for clarity of speech, almighty God. I pray for boldness, almighty God. I thank you, mighty God, and I pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen thank you. you may take your seats thank you so much i just want to thank the praise team the worship team why don't we give them a thank you clap <laughs> they are always uh they are always ever so amazing today i'm doing this on my own so it, uh, i hope it works so where am i supposed to okay yeah there it's there <laughs> i said you must do it. He says, no, 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 you can manage this, but let's see how it goes. Yeah, no, thank you so much. So today we are talking about the marketplace, serving God in the marketplace. And before we start, please allow me to just thank uh, Pastor Z. We thank you so much. Uh, Mrs. Z, we thank you, our senior pastors, for allowing me to just stand here before you. It's not something that I take lightly. Thank you very much. I also thank the elders and the leadership uh, in the house. Uh, we have been uh, looking at the series of serving God, and uh, I must say my job is very easy because between Pastor Z, Pastor Hara, and uh, Pastor Charles, they've all really set the scene very nicely. And uh, today we're just talking about the marketplace. And uh, when we talk about the marketplace, I started by looking at the definition. What do we really mean by a marketplace? And um, when we talk about the marketplace, I thought, you know, is it, is it work? Is it where we work? Is it where we do business? Is it, you know, so we, I had all these different definitions in my mind, and I thought, let me do a bit of work uh, on this. And... Um, I think the first thing to say is uh, a marketplace is really where, uh, you know, you have uh, a system or a place where an exchange happens. Because whenever you're in a marketplace, you will exchange. Yes, we are buying and selling and the businessmen and women have kind of taken over and thinking the marketplace is only about business, but it's not. It's a lot more than that. So when we're talking about the marketplace, we're talking about a place where you are able to exchange for a reward. So the two main words there are exchange and a reward. And the ultimate person who really uh, helped us understand this is Jesus Christ himself. Because on the cross, when he died on the cross, he exchanged our sins and gave us his righteousness. So he exchanged. And that's where the exchange happens. And we see it there. And we, have, we are righteous because he took away our sins. And uh, so you see, it's not just about, um, you know, about business. And we also see that uh, before money, you know, started, there was a butter system. And people used to exchange, I'm giving you clothes, you give me this. So there was a lot of exchange. But then I thought, why don't we go into our modern day and say, what does it really say? And we can see there, if you look at the second uh, uh, point there. The marketplace is really a simple, effective, and economic way where customers and sellers have it easy when it comes to selling. Ideally, in an ideal world, it should be easy. You should just go there, I'm buying this, I'm selling this. It's on the marketplace. We also see that a marketplace is any location. It's not just, um, you know, this happening here at Mulungushi or in Lusaka. It's actually any location, even online. You know, I was intrigued to say for those who are watching us online, you are in the marketplace. So whether you are in the marketplace or not, as long as you are exchanging one thing to another, you know, you are actually in the marketplace. Uh, but the interesting thing is that when we talk about marketplace, we're not just exchanging uh, goods, and we'll see this in the word. And the word, um, okay, yeah. So if we see this in the word, um, you know, it does say, if we go to Matthew 23, 4 quickly, and it says about 9 in the morning. And the marketplace is mentioned many times in the Bible. 
uh, it doesn't define it that this is the marketplace, but it's mentioned many, many times. You know, about nine in the morning, so this man, he owns a vineyard, he went out and he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So this man is going and he finds people because he's looking for workers for his vineyard. And he finds them doing nothing. Maybe they were doing nothing by choice. Maybe they were unemployed. But whatever the case, they were doing nothing. And he says, you don't have to do nothing. You can actually work for me. And he demonstrates that in the marketplace, you can also play a part where you find somebody doing nothing. And you can say, you can actually come and do something for me in the marketplace. So it's not just about employer, employee per se, but even you, you can just say, what are you doing? You're doing nothing. What can you do for me? And the story, you can read it on your own. He goes there and he, you know, he goes ahead and hires a number of people who actually work for him. And in Luke 7, 31 to 32, this one was interesting because he was saying, uh, to what then shall I liken the men of this generation? And I'm saying, God, how did you know that this is our generation? He's talking about our generation, where you have children sitting around in the marketplace, you know, just calling one another and saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not weep. So here we are talking about... Um, you know, you know the, the, the Lord is actually giving this parable where he's saying, you know, you are like the men in this generation, you know, who are like the children who are just sitting around. And this is the generation we are living in. If you go in the marketplace, you find a lot of people just sitting around. Maybe they are not working, maybe it's by choice, but they are in the marketplace. They are in the marketplace. And as we, we go ahead, I think the role will be, what role do we play to those children who are just sitting around? But the Bible says it's in this generation. And I'm saying, God, you wrote the word a hundred years ago, but you're still saying in this generation. It shows that the Lord will speak to us even now. And uh, amen. 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 You have to encourage me so that, um, you know, we... Pastor Z does this every Sunday. I'm like, eh, hey, Pastor, this is hard. But anyway, so you have to encourage us. And, uh, you know, but then it goes to the church. And when Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. And he was saying, my house is a house of prayer. And you have made it a den of robbers. And here what he's referring to is that the church is in the marketplace. But the church is not a church where we'll come here and start selling things. Here, it goes on to say, it's a house of prayer. So we are in the marketplace. We are expected to pray and equip so that we can go there and support those children who we just spoke about in the word. So we have to be very clear that the church is in, even here, the temple was very much in the marketplace, but it's what were they doing at the temple. So a church is not a club where we come here and, you know, we just meet those who are registered in the club. No, this is where we pray so that we can be effective when we go out there. And uh, I'm just going to read uh, very quickly, and uh, uh, please do pardon me because this is quite a long scripture. But it's important for us to understand, to understand who is the marketplace. When we talk about the marketplace, who is in there? Is it just as Christians? So let's just read together. Just as the body, so 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 31. And maybe I'll jump some places just for time. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether we are Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, we were given the one spirit to drink. So even so, the body is not made up of one part of the, of the many. Now, if the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong the body, it would not be for that reason stop being part of the body. 
And if the ear stop being part of the body, it would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not be for that reason stop being part of the body. So if the whole body were an eye, what would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, what would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be, every one of them. If there were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On, on the contrary, these parts of the body that seem to be weaker and indispensable. So those parts that are weaker are indispensable. And the parts that think are less honorable, we must treat with honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are to be treated in special modesty, while other presentable parts need no treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. And uh, I'll leave it there. So I just want to emphasize that when we talk about the marketplace, we are all the marketplace. It's not just Grace City members that are in the marketplace. Everybody out there has a role to play. Whether you are in Soweto, whether you are a Christian, whether you are not born again, you are part of the marketplace. So the marketplace should not just be thinking, this is just for Christians. No, it's everyone in it is a market, is actually in the marketplace. And you can't say we can manage as Grace City or as Christians to carry on in the marketplace without those guys. Because it's one body. And the ones who need us most are actually not the ones who are fine. You know, so the Bible is also very clear that those who actually have issues, who are weak, you know, who are troubled, are the ones who actually need us more than those who are okay. In fact, it says those who are okay, pay less attention to them. Amen. So if you find somebody's just okay, and they are fine, you know, they are Christians, everything is working well, pay less attention to them. There's a place for them. You're going to show them love, but pay less attention. Pay more attention to those who are weak, to those who don't know Christ yet, to those who are sick, because those are the ones coming in the marketplace saying, I am here to exchange my weakness for my strength. I am here to exchange my illness for healing. I am here to exchange my jobless situation for a job. I am here to exchange my fear for, for strength. So God wants us to acknowledge for us as Christians that yes, we, the, everyone is in the marketplace and everyone has a role to play, especially us Christians. And the word is what is our role as we come in the marketplace. And um, the Bible is also very clear that it's really for the Great Commission. You know, the Great Commission and Effective Ministry. And as Natasha was, was, was leading us, she was very much in the word that all of us need that effective ministry. But let's talk about the Great Commission first. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. What is the instruction? What is God instructing us to do? Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of time. So that is the instruction that we have. So when we are in the marketplace, the first thing we have to remember is we are here for the Great Commission. We are here to make sure. And Pastor Z, like I say, my job is simple because he has covered this already in the, in the basic principles. He has covered them to say, why are we in the marketplace? We are there so that we can go there and baptize. We can go there and teach. 
We can go there and talk to people about the word of God. That is the commandment that he has given us. So that people may be healed. Because in the marketplace, like I say, it's a place of exchange. It's a place of exchange and reward. If we have to think about anything on the marketplace, just think about exchange and reward. And exchange is not just business. Business is important. But you can even exchange your weaknesses your illnesses, whatever you are lacking, you are able to bring it to the marketplace. Why? Because you find Christians there like us waiting for you. But only if we do our part. Amen. Only if we do our part. Only if we, otherwise we'll all be in the body and the weak will be on their own and the strong on their own and they are all separate. The idea is that we should be together. We should be together so that we are bringing the great commission to them because that is the commandment to make all nations, and as Grace City, that's what we believe in, all nations, whether you belong to Grace City or not, whether you are visiting or not, for us it's about, grace, it's about the Great Commission. For us to baptize and teach and obey the word. And uh, if we can move on very quickly, we, as we have said, we are sons and daughters of Christ. We are already sons and daughters. However, like I say, the responsibility is for us to go out there uh, on the great, and uh, really take the Great Commission. Like I say, especially to those who are less honorable, less presentable. The Bible there is saying those who are in a position of weakness, especially those, that is our role and that is our job. I think we have covered this. And as we are looking at this, I was thinking, but then uh, what really... Um, um, I think this is just talking about the effective commission, so we'll share the slides. But what really is our responsibility as we come into the marketplace? Do we have the right, are we equipped even? Because you can say, but for me, I don't belong to this ministry, so it's very difficult for me to actually do this. So I don't belong, you know, I'm not an usher, so you want me to usher, it's difficult. I'm not an intercessor, it's difficult. Are we equipped to do that? And the Bible is very clear and it says, you know, in Acts that I will equip you. You know, so you will come there even if you are not equipped. Whatever ministry you are in, you don't have to worry because you will be equipped. But let's just quickly talk about the different, and uh, Pastor Charles had spoken about the fruits of the Spirit. Today I just want to talk about the different callings that we have. And, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 12, 27 to 30 it just says, but are we all apostles? So it says you will be apostles, teachers, prophets, miracle workers. You'll be able to interpret the word. And indeed, you'll be able to have gifts of healing. But at the end of the day, we are all individuals. So we come as one body. But First Corinthians 12 is very clear that we all have individual strengths. We all have individual gifts. So as we are in the marketplace, we are in the marketplace, we are one body. There's all of us who have needs. All of us have needs. We can't say because we are Christians we have no needs. But the, way, but the point is, do we have the gifts to go out there? Do we understand our purpose? What is your purpose? What is my purpose? Yes, we have the gifts. And uh, if you are an apostle, you have to go there because in the marketplace, we should all be apostles. But there are some who have more gifting than others in other areas. So we also acknowledge that. That's why we are one body. You know, that's why it says the ear, the ear can just sit there and say, but, uh, you know, I'm sick today. The body can't function. So all of us have to come together as one body. So I just wanted to um, just talk a little bit about how we identify our purpose. Because I think it's important for us. And what we are bringing here, don't try and search this in the Bible because it's not there. This is a management tool. So it's a management tool that uh, I'm just going to use to, to just talk about how we identify our purpose. What is your purpose? Because when we're in the marketplace, you struggle a lot to say, but, you know, what really is my purpose? What do I do? Does it mean my job is my ministry? Does it mean because I'm working, then that's where I need to be? So ikigai is a Japanese concept. So this is not my concept, it's Japanese. It's a Japanese concept that means reason for being. So iki means... 
uh, you know, it describes, you know, the value for your worth, ikigai. And uh, like I say, it's not a Christian, it's not a Christian concept, it's a management concept, but um, it does explain this very well. Because the debate is usually, but I have a job, does it mean my job is my ministry? And the answer could be yes. It could be yes, if you look at a footballer, footballer do what, they do what they love, and in some cases, it's a job, but it's also a ministry. So whatever you are doing, do it excellently, and we'll talk a bit about that. But the bottom line is that a job is a job because you get paid for it. So, you know, you, you get paid for it. I, I started uh, when females lead an organization that uh, we run with a number of ladies simply because I just thought the job that I do at the bank, I'm getting paid for it. I was thinking, but this is a profession. So if it's a profession, there were times when I felt maybe I'm not really serving God to the maximum because what I'm doing here, I'm getting paid for it. You know, and we're going to look at an example of the, the men and women who have served because it's the right thing to do and not, let me just put a much clearer slide. I don't know how clear this is, but that's a clearer slide there. Uh, of Ikigai. So, your job is your profession. So, you know, this is where, and you can ask yourself these questions. What is my job? Do I get paid for it? If you get paid for it, that's fine. It's still okay. That's why Ikigai is in the middle, because you still get paid for it. But what are you good at? It's always good to identify yourself to say, but what are you good at? And sometimes you do a job because you were just looking for a job and you found it, and you are doing it, but you are not, that's not really, and you do it excellently, but is that what you are good at? You always have to say to yourself, what am I good at? But what, and that's your passion. What you are good at is your passion. What you get paid for is your profession. Together, what do we get, what we get paid for, what is it? And what we are good at? What we love is also our passion. So you love something because it's a passion. And, but the bottom line is that what does the world need from you? So what the world, remember, it's not about what do you need from the world. It's not just about getting, getting. It's about what does the world need from you. What the world needs from you, that's where your calling comes in. And if you are blessed like many people, maybe just some people, what you get paid for could also be what the world needs from you. So you do it excellently. But when it comes to you, what is your calling? And let's just give an example of our man of God who does this very well. You know? So, because I think he, he, he ticks all the boxes. He ticks all the boxes. And I was trying very hard to find some, some, some pictures on the internet. So I think for him, you know, when you look at Pastor Sunny, number one, he works. And he works, he gets paid for, for it. Meaning it's what? Profession. Are we together? It's his profession. He works, it's his profession. However, he also runs a family business. You know, he runs a family business. There, I think, is the, I've got a few, a tanker there. He runs his family business. So it's also his profession. However, he also does what he loves best. Whenever he talks here and he gives an example, he'll talk about the astronaut, you know, when I was in Dubai, we saw the stars. You know, you, you hear him say that all the time because it's his passion. He loves it. He loves so much. Whenever he gives an example, it's about the astronauts. Very intelligent, an engineer, and that's what he loves. But he also realized that, is that what God wants me to do? Is that enough? No. Is that enough? So he says, no. For me, my calling is I want to be a pastor. Amen. Now we're together. I want to be a pastor so that I can serve. Going back to what we say, Don Ikigai. Going back to there. You know, when you serve, you are doing what the world needs from you. So when you're in the marketplace, we did a bit of management. We're doing a bit of management here, and I'll leave it there. It's just important to know what your purpose is. What is your purpose? Because when you know what your purpose is, you will be more effective 
in the marketplace. As long as you are not sure what your purpose is, you will not be effective. We will not go and see those people who need us so much, those people who are weak, those people who need healing. So it's always important for us to understand what does the world need from us. Yes, Pastor Sunny has a job and he gets paid for it, but... Is that what the world needs from him? Probably yes, but he realized himself that it's important that he does that extra calling in terms of my calling is to be a pastor. What is your calling? What is your calling? Because it's only when you understand your calling as Christians that will be effective in the marketplace. Because the marketplace is waiting for you and me to go out there and look for people who are in need for us to take the Great Commission. But we all have to do it in line with our purpose and our gifts. Are we together? Are we together? So if we may continue a little bit in terms of some of the, um, you know, some of the people in the, in, in the Bible, we've given an example of our own pastor who is living the different circles of Wikigai, you know, but then in the word, you find that, um, let's talk about influence, and we'll talk about just about three uh, men and women of God, and then we'll be done. Uh, in terms of influence, what is our influence in the market? For all of us, we have to acknowledge that we are here for such a time as this. You know, if you go back to Esther, and I'm not going to read the detail, because I want us to pray in the end, so I'm not going to read so much because um, you know the stories. You know, but uh, if you just go to Esther 4, 10 and 11, here Esther is instructed, I hope it's clear. Esther is, Esther is instructed by Mordecai, you know, to say, look, we're in trouble here and we are looking for you to go and see the king. You know, you, you are married to the king, go and see the king. You can go and talk to him so that he doesn't persecute us, the Jews. And Esther, who is in a position of influence, the first thing he, she does is that, no, 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 me, I can't, me. But they're saying, but you, you are married to the king. You mean you can't go and talk to him? He says, no, 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 I have to make an appointment and this and this and that. And many a times we find ourselves in that situation where we are in positions of influence in the marketplace and people ask us, for us to support them, but we say, no, not now. We are like Queen Esther. And may God deliver me from that, you know? Because we come there and say, no, 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 God, no, no, it can't happen. Me, I, you know, there was somebody who called me once, and they were giving me this very complicated case, and they said, because you, you know the president. I'm like, me, you know? I don't know the president. And they're like, no, 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 but we always see you, you know, whenever. I'm like, mm, guys, that's work, you know? So you, you remove yourself from there because you, you are scared to be in the position of influence. You are saying, me, I don't know the president. Try other people. Why? Because other people will look at you as you're in a position of influence, but you, you remove yourself and say, I cannot do it. So in the marketplace, and you can say, oh, Mizinga, and maybe you, you are talking because you're a CEO, even you. Other people in your family are looking at you and say, you are the one in a position of influence. Whatever you are doing, just say to your neighbor, they are looking at me. If they are looking at me, say to your neighbor, it's me they are looking at, my family. Huh? Yeah, so you are saying, no, but me, I have no job. I don't think they mean me. They mean you, even them, like Queen Esther. You will come and say, no, but I'm not in a position of influence. You are in a position of influence. The fact that you even woke up in the morning, you are sitting in this congregation at Grace City, it means you are privileged. It means you are privileged. It means you've got what it takes to influence, you know? And don't look to say, how does influence look like? It looks like you. You know, that's how it looks like, you know? Yeah. Influence looks like you trust me. Go and see those people in Soweto who couldn't get up this morning, who are so weak because they are so hungry, because they have no jobs, because they haven't eaten for the last few days, and then you tell them, I'm not, influ I'm not influential. You are. You know, according to the marketplace and what we're talking about and the service God wants us to do in the marketplace, it applies to you and me. And Mordecai challenged Esther there. He said, Esther, you are privileged. You go there. And Esther has to say, okay, maybe let me fast. You know, in my mind, I'm thinking there was no need for all that. 
You know, that's your husband. Esther could have just gone and spoken to him, you know, and say, you know, let's get this. But we're not talking about Esther today per se. But she could have made it happen. But she was scared. If she knew very well that she's influential, but she was scared to call herself influential. As I was studying this, I said, Father God, forgive me for the many times that I thought I'm not influential when I am. For the many times when I misused my influence, when I should not have misused my influence. If we can just go on, and the message there is that for everyone in the marketplace, let's look out for the weak for those who are indispensable, for those who have weaknesses, and let's say to them, what role are we going to play in their role, in their lives? Let's look for another favorite man of God called Joseph. You know, Joseph, um, he, had, uh, he was in the marketplace. And uh, like I say, because of time, today we're running late, we've got Holy Communion, so I'm not going to go into reading a lot of scriptures, but Genesis 15, 19 to 21, maybe we can read this quickly. But Joseph said to them, and that's his brothers, background, his brothers have offended him greatly. They sold him. You know, they buried him in a pit, sold him. And now, they, you know, many, many years later, they are very hungry because there's a famine, in, you know, wherever they are coming from. And now they come to him and say, we need help. You know, and when they realize that this is Joseph we are talking about, you know, and they are scared. They're like, what are we going to do? But he is in the marketplace. He has to deal with people who have offended him. But he said to them, don't be afraid. I am in a place of God because I'm in the place of God. You, what you intended me for harm, uh, you know, God has intended it for good, for me to accomplish what is now being done, you know, saving many lives. So in the marketplace, we'll find ourselves dealing with people we don't like, dealing with people who have offended us, dealing with family members that you are saying, you, me, when I get promoted, you get it. You know, that, that's the marketplace, you know, but that's not what God intends us. God intends us to have the Joseph spirit that when you are in a place of privilege, regardless, you should look at them and say, God has placed me here for such a time as this. God has placed me here for good. Maybe whatever you are doing, it could be your boss. You know how it is sometimes with, with people at work. You know, you, you, maybe you are fired for the wrong reasons. You go somewhere else and you, you do well. Maybe you become even a minister or whatever and you are saying you'll see. No. God is saying, I'm placing you there. Forget about the unforgiveness. A marketplace is not a place for unforgiveness. It's, you know, and uh, there's a song, I'm sure the priest knows it, which says there's a very special place, very special place in heaven for people who save others. There's a place for all of us, but very extra special for those who save others, especially those who save others in the marketplace. So when you're in the marketplace, regardless of what anyone would have done to you, would have offended you, a family member, a whatever, they did this to you, they fired you, they whatever, when you are in the marketplace, it's a place for you to serve. It's a place for you to look out and say, who can I serve? You know, who can I serve? But we are called to be excellent. We've covered Daniel already in our series. If, we haven't, uh, if you haven't uh, read Daniel, please go back and read it. Because we covered Daniel. In the marketplace, us as Christians, there's an expectation. Yes, we've spoken about the people who are, who are in a weak position, who are sick, who are maybe who don't even know Christ because they're all part of one body. We are, they're all our brothers and sisters. We have spoken about that. They are all our brothers and sisters. But bottom line is, in whatever we are doing, we are expected to be excellent. Say to yourself, I'm expected to be excellent. Your excellence is what should drive us. In whatever we are doing, whether we are serving in the church, excellence. Not pastor says, come at nine, you, you are coming at 9.30. Why? If it was work, you would have been there at nine. You understand? Ah, but this is church. You have to be excellent. You know, whatever you do, aim. And trust me, we all fail. I all fail miserably. But we must all endeavor to be excellent. So that people can see even at your places of work, as you are doing your profession, 
they should be able to see that, mm, Sister Agatha, have you seen how excellent it is? Even if she works for the ministry, others just come, they leave their jackets and go, ha, she doesn't do that. You know, they should be able to say, there should be a difference. That's the only way we'll make a difference in the marketplace. Are we together? Say, I have to be excellent. You have to be excellent so that you can lead by example, so that those people who are weak, they can see that they actually have to be better because you are better. If you are better, they will also be better. But also when you are excellent, you will find time and that extra mile to go and serve those who are in a position of weakness. And Pastor Z covered, and this is the last one we are looking at, he covered it last week. He said we are blessed. You know, he wants us to be prosperous. He was talking about money. He was saying we have to be comfortable around money. You know, he was saying to himself, I'm very comfortable with money. But when you are blessed, you are not blessed for yourself. You are blessed to bless others. The minute you start looking for a job so that you can, it can be about you, trust me, you'll be looking for a very long time. But the minute you put God first and say, God, I am in the marketplace, and God, I promise you, you give me a job, you give me that promotion, I will make a difference in the marketplace. I will look for somebody who is in the position of weakness. I will look for somebody who, who does everything so that I pray for them, for them to know God. God is going to bless you quicker than if you just go there, God, please bless me so that, you know, that weave I was looking at, you know, I was thinking, you know, it's about time now I bought it, you know. No, 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 no. God will say, mm-mm. Let me, have you seen that some people hold a lot of money easily? Others don't. You know me, I argue with a lot of people because some people, I don't know. You know, like, you, is, you, after everything you've done, this is all you have. But God, maybe instead of giving me, try them. God said, mm, those, there is no way they'll channel it to the word of God, to the marketplace. Are we together? So you, the more you do things to say, I want to prosper for the marketplace, the more God will bless you. Because the Bible says, and uh, you know, we're not going to read that, uh, but it says the weaker, the parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. Meaning, we, we can't get rid of them. They are weak. We can't get rid of them. You know, and those parts that they think they are less honorable, we have to give, give greater honor. So when you are blessed with your blessings, take those to people who are weaker, who are indispensable, who need greater honor. They require it more, and you'll be blessed more. So may we get to the point where you are saying, God, can you bless me so that I can be effective in the marketplace. Amen. 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 Are we together? So in the marketplace, we are expected, you know, to serve. We are expected because we are blessed. Like I say, don't call yourself not blessed. Please, please, please confess. Confess for saying you are not blessed. Because you are. Because there's somebody who woke up today in the marketplace with nothing. They are the ones who are not blessed. You are blessed. So sometimes we come here every time, Father God bless me, you are already blessed. Yes, but bless me for what? For me to be more effective in the marketplace. My business, Father God, I started my business and I lost all my money. There's nothing that could happen. But when I bless you, what are you going to do for me in the marketplace? You know, you are blessed to be a blessing. It's a commandment. Go there and be blessed, you know. But everything said and done. We have to love one another. This is maybe a more comfortable one than, eh, hey, prosperous, and you don't want to save, you know, my needs for me, don't give others. But this one is more comfortable. Love one another. And I think it's in NIV, which says, love each other deeply. Deeply, not just love each other, but love each other deeply. Here it's not just talking about loving, no, no, the less honorable. Everybody, even here in church, we have to come from a position of love. We've got to love each other, um, dear beloved. We have to love each other. You know, where you look out for each other. Uh, you know, where you forgive each other. Maybe somebody has offended you. You know, because we are together, we are a family. We are bound to offend each other even here in church. But forgive quickly. 
and move on and, and always look at things from a good place and say, I'm sure they meant well. I'm sure they meant well. Forgive each other. Love each other. Look out for people who are in need and be out there to actually support them. Praise them. Please come and, uh, and support me as, 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 we are, as we are closing. So love is very, very important. It's just for us to be out there and say whatever we are doing, we have to actually love each other. And I think we already spoke about us being prosperous because when we are pr prosperous, when we are blessed, uh, Pastor Charles covered this actually in the intercession yesterday, 3 John 11, beloved, I wish above all things that you may be in good health. You may prosper even as your soul prospers. And the expectation is for us to, when you are prosperous, it's easy for us to be effective. And uh, I think we already spoke about that. But finally, I think it's important for us to, to, to really pray for our situations. We've spoken about the marketplace. We've spoken about how important it is for us to get to that position, to understand that the marketplace is not just as Christians, but it's for the Great Commission, for us to go out there, to preach the word, to baptize. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. You come in church, yes, you raise your hand. You go out there, you are ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. You know, you are in a place of influence, beloved. Where you are right now, you are in a place of influence. So it's important for us to speak about that. But I think most importantly, as we start, let's just talk, as we end, I just want to talk to...